When you audit a class in college, uh, you're saying that I want the information without the responsibility, without the struggle of doing the work, without the struggle of taking exams, that you want to learn the information without the responsibility. And so it's an interesting thing is you want to learn whatever the course is trying to teach, but you don't want any homework and you don't want the exams. Uh, I don't want the work, <laughs> I just want the knowledge. And you may be able to do that in college, but how many of you know you can't do that in life? You can't just audit life. Many people come to church to be inspired, to be encouraged, to hear God's word, but don't plan to do any of the work and they want to eliminate struggle. In fact, I've seen that some parents want to eliminate all the struggle for their kids. And when you do that, you will cause your kid to, to grow up selfish and, and, and prideful. And so what you want to do is we all have to have struggle in life because struggle is really where we grow in depth in character, where we grow in our depth in life. And so a lot of times we don't want to incur any responsibility of it, but we like the learning aspect of it. And so in college, when you audit a class, you don't get credit for that class. Why? Because you did not do what that course required. And so when you audit the Christian life by coming to hear God's word, by coming to be inspired by God's word, to be encouraged by God's word, but you don't act on it, you may have more knowledge, more encouragement, but you won't be changed. You won't be transformed into the image of God. Today, I want to talk about struggle. Because if you eliminate struggle, you will eliminate much of what will bring character, what will bring depth to your life. And so it's not something you just want to get rid of. Look at the very first verse on your outline. It's found in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. It says, Beloved, do not be surprised. Say surprised. At the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange things were happening to you. So there's an ordeal. There's a fiery ordeal that comes upon each and every one of us for the purpose of what? Testing. Thank you. One person was listening. God bless you. Thank you, Mom. I appreciate that. <laughs> so what Peter is saying here is that there's going to be struggle in your life. And don't be surprised as though some strange thing is happening to you in life. And if you want to be all that God wants you to be, then the greatest classroom that you will have, that every single one of us will go through, is that of struggle. How many of you say, Pastor Brian, when I walked in here today, I felt like I was going through a struggle? Anybody? All right. And so we can go through struggle. In fact, we all go through struggles. Struggle is 10% of what happens to every single one of us. I have my 10%, you have your 10%, right? But the key is the 90% of what we do with that 10% in our life. Some people take that struggle in their life and it propels them to a greater relationship, to a greater wholeness in life, and to others it can destroy them. They let that 10%, that little slice of life affect them all the rest of their life and they don't learn from it and they don't grow from it. And so it is important that as we go through struggle that, that we, we learn to deal with struggle. And let me say this, the reason why we struggle is we live with imperfect people. How many of you live with imperfect people? Don't raise your hand, too late. <laughs> we live, we work with, we come in contact with people who have hurts, habits, and hang-ups, don't they? They have weaknesses and problems and insecurities and immaturities and fears and do foolish things. And then there are people other than ourselves that do foolish things as well. <laughs> and so we all kind of want to remove struggle 
in our lives, but if we do that, it will be to our detriment. We all have that struggle. I can remember, how many of you had this too, that when you were in grade school, the teacher brought an incubator with all these eggs in there and you would hatch chicks. Anybody see that process? You guys went to the wrong schools anyway. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And I can remember our teacher had that and, and there was eggs and there was a process that the teacher would teach us about the little chick that was growing inside. And then at the end of the process, uh, the teacher would say, hey, come and look. And everybody from the class gathered around and there in the incubator, that chick was pecking out of that shell. And inevitably when that happens, somebody will say, hey, let's, let's break the shell. Let's help the chicken out. And it's interesting because scientists tell us that even a chick coming out of the egg when it's being hatched needs to be able to pick its own way out to get out of the eggshell and if you just take the shell and you break it for that chick you know what happens that chick will literally die because there's something that happens in the in the uh, circulatory system when that chick breaks out and it helps to strengthen them struggling to get out of the shell you remove the struggle and you remove the development and even its life of that chick and so Peter says, don't think it a strange thing when you have a fiery ordeal, when you have struggles, for it is the testing of your faith. And the testing of your faith is so important. And so as we understand God's role for struggle, I want you to write this down, that we must be willing to experience struggle for the sake of growth, for the sake of growth in our lives. Now, before we talk about struggles, I, I want to give you some foundational facts about struggles that I think will help us through the process. And the first one, number one, if you'd write this down, is God always works for our good. God always works for our good. And that's an important aspect to get a hold of because a lot of people think when they're going through struggle, they think that God is out to get them. And that's not the case. Look what it says in Romans 8.31. It says this, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? And then 1 John 4.8 says this, The one who does not love does not know God, for God is, say with me, love. So the very character of God is that of love. And listen, God works in his character. He works in his attributes. He does not go outside of those. He does not go outside of the character of love because God is love. God is holy. God is omniscient. God is all just. God is holy. That means he's perfect in every aspect. And so God does not work outside of the bounds of his character because it's who God is. And so it's so important to know that God doesn't always cause a struggle, but if he allows it and we love God and we want to do his will, then he always works for our good. Look what it says in Hebrews 12, 5 and 6. He says, and have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his ch children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you for the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his children. So what he's saying here is God's discipline does not come out of anger, but God's discipline for us always comes out of his love. God bursts everything into my life because he loves me. So everything must be interpreted in the light of his character. So when we talk about struggle, you have to talk about it through his character, through the character of love. So everything that touches my life is because of God's love that is there for me. The Pharisees had a warped definition of God. They were doing weird things and Jesus comes on the scene and he says, hey, wait a minute, guys. 
you're messing the whole thing up. You're messing up my word. You're destroying people's lives. And they said, no, we study the scriptures and we've studied it for years. And Jesus said, you are mistaken because you do not know the scriptures, nor do you know the power of God. And what he was saying here is you have misinterpreted and mistaken scriptures because you don't know the character of God. And so what they did, they were holding people to the letter of the law. Jesus comes along and says, the letter of the law destroys, but the spirit of the law brings life. So we need to interpret through God's character, but the Pharisees were interpreting scripture through their own character. And so we have to remember when we talk about struggle, God always works out all the struggles we go through for our own good. But some people might say, well, how about our sin? Because you see, sometimes my struggle come, can come from my own sin. And that's true. The Bible says it's not on your outline, but in 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, he says, if any of you suffer, let him not suffer as a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome med a meddler. So we can cause our own struggle, but what happens if that takes place? Write this down, number two, repentance is great news. Repentance is great news, and this is a foundational fact. You see, no matter how far you've strayed, how far that you've gone off track, this morning I want you to know that it's always just one step back to the Lord. Could you imagine there's some people, and I've seen them do that, they're going on the right track. All of a sudden, they get off, and they get on the wrong road, going the wrong direction. Can you, how many of you remember the days before navigational systems <laughs> when we had maps? How many of you remember those days? You guys are old. Anyway, um, it's amazing how some people, in a spiritual sense, get off the wrong road and they know they're going the wrong way, but they keep going down that wrong road. And they keep going, and they keep going, and they keep going, and they keep going. And all you have to do is get off the off-ramp, get back on the right road, and come back. It's that simple. The Lord gives us something that is so great, and it's called repentance. It means you're going the wrong direction, and you turn back and go God's way. See, one of God's greatest weapons against sin is that of repentance. But if the enemy of your soul, if the devil can get you from repenting or confessing your sin, then he has a hook in you. See, it's not the sin that destroys God's people, it's unresolved sin. Now here's a familiar verse to most of you. 1 John 1, 9, it says this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness that's good news isn't it a repenting church is a healthy church a repenting man a repenting woman is a healthy man or a healthy woman in fact it was such an important thing there was a missionary his name was Hudson Taylor very famous missionary to uh, uh, the inland of China and he would greet people with that in the morning. So instead of saying, good morning, how are you? He would say, good morning, have you repented yet today? <laughs> Why? Because he knew a repenting person was a healthy person. And if we think repentance is bad news, we won't repent. But if God puts his finger on something in your life that there is something wrong, one of the greatest things that we can do with that is that we don't hide it, we don't deny it, but we confess and repent and change directions. And then the third one here this morning is this, God will never waste a hurt. God will never waste a hurt. Another familiar verse, sometimes it's overused, but it's so important when we talk about struggle. It says, and we know that God causes, say with me, all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And so what he's saying, if you love God, if the intent of your heart is to do God's will, if you stumble and if you fall, 
God will take all your problems by his grace and his mercy and his power and he's going to work it out for good. Isn't that good news? It's great news. God works all those things out for good, even our mistakes. Even in our struggles that we go through, they're always for a reason. Look what it says here in Genesis 50, 20. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Can you imagine Joseph who loves the Lord, who is a godly young man, and because of really no fault of his own except for his immaturity, he gets thrown into a pit by his jealous brothers. He gets sold into slavery. And Joseph is there. Can you imagine if Joseph would have wallowed in his self-pity and said, look at they did that. Look at they said this. They did that. They did that. He would miss the whole point of what was going on. God was working in him to move him to a certain place. And wherever Joseph was, Joseph worked hard as he was working for the Lord, for God's purpose. And his brothers who tried to kill him, he saw him, saw them. He could have killed them and destroyed them like that. But he said this, what you meant for evil, God turned around for good. You know, in the same way, how many of you in your life walking that the enemy meant something for evil, but God turned around it for good? And I think he does in all of our lives. He turns those things around for our good. Amen? I've had many professors, some uh, famous, some uh, very astute, but the ones who made the most impact of my life, who were the ones who spoke out of their struggles, and those are the ones who overcome certain things. And boy, when they shared, it made an impact on my life. There was another famous missionary, and I'll butcher his name, but it's Adonian Judson, who was one of the great famed missionaries to Burma, who God brought thousands and a great revival to that part of the world. But when he first went to Burma, his ministry was filled with very hard times and many struggles. Some of his kids got sick and passed away through sickness. The first seven years, he only had one convert. And then the next 17 months, they locked him in a prison. And not just any prison, they shackled him to a wall with his wrist and his ankles. And as they threw him in prison, they eventually let him out, but it was so bad he had scars all over his wrist and his ankles from being shackled. And when he got out, he went to an overseer of a certain area in Burma. And he was trying to reach those who were unreached in a certain part of Burma. And he goes to the overseer and he asked the ruler of that place if he would allow him to go and to be a missionary in this section. And the overseer said no. And Judson asked why, and the ruler said this, we are not so foolish to believe so quickly in the words you say. But he said, I am concerned because the people might be convinced by the scars you bear. Isn't that interesting? See, words are cheap, but scars run deep. And God works through scars, and he'll never waste a hurt and he will use that to reach another. How do we take that foundational understanding and learn about struggle? There's three points here in closing. The first one is our faith must be tested. Our faith must be tested. And I've said this before, when our faith is being tested, it's not being tested to destroy us. But it's testing to see that it can withstand the weight. If I were to put 215 pounds on this table, hopefully it would bear underneath the weight. If not, then this table needs to be reinforced, right? And so I'm testing it, not in order to destroy this table, but just to see if it can bear up underneath the weight, right? And so that's the kind of testing that we go through 
to see what's inside of us. Someone once said Christians are like tea bags. You don't know what kind of tea bag it is until you stick it in boiling water. Then you find out what kind it is. And so a lot of times we don't find out what's inside of us until we go through a struggle, right? You heard me say sandpaper people. Rough us up and smooth us out. We find out what's inside and it usually comes out of our mouth. And so our faith must be tested before God can build on it. Look what it says in James 1 verse 2 and then I'm going to read 3 and 4 to you. It says, consider all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Now how many of you when you're going through a trial you count it all joy? Yeah, I didn't think so. I don't either. <laughs> but we should and the reason being, it goes on to say, for you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance and let perseverance have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing and that's why we count it all joy because God works through that there were several people in first service who came to me after service going through great amounts of pain it's amazing how God whispers to us in the good times but he shouts to us in our pain and we can hear God and we have to allow those hard times, those struggles to affect us in such a way that it tests us and what becomes important is important and what's not important kind of gets burned or taken to the wayside. Your faith will not be able to produce anything unless it is tested. The testing causes endurance and it causes character to be produced. If not, your faith will just be a religion. It'll be something you have, a religion you have, but will not be able to produce any fruit. But God will test it and it becomes productive. Would you write that down? When our faith is tested in the bullet point, then your faith will be productive. There will be a productive faith. You'll see many things being produced through your faith. People being saved and baptized and, and people around you being touched, people being healed, and we'll see the fruit of the Lord all around you. And then number two, struggles prompt us to change. Struggles prompt us to change. See, if we never struggled, we'd never change. God wants us to get past good intentions. You hear me say this, God loves you just the way you are. Do you know that? God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to keep you that way, <laughs> right? And so there's a change that takes place and it, it only gets changed a lot of times either through God's word that is really embedded in us or if not, through struggle. And again, we're all gonna go through struggle. If you never struggled, we would never change. See, God wants us to get to a place that we can become more like him. So God allows struggles to come. So the pain of staying the same becomes so great that the pain to change becomes less than staying the way we are. And you say, Lord, this is so bad, I can't stand it. So I need to change. In Proverbs 20, 30, it says, stripes that wound scur away evil and strokes reach the innermost parts in other words as we go through through struggles as we go through wounds or stripes there's a change that reaches even the innermost that we go through because we really are forced to look at things in a different way Joshua 7.10 says this, So the Lord said to Joshua, Rise up. Why is it that you have fallen on your face? Let me give you context because Joshua and the children of Israel just went through the battle with the walls of Jericho. They saw a great miracle as the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. In defeat, other nations were terrified. So they were going against this other little country that was in their way as they were going to the promised land. It was uh, the city of Ai. And there was just a few thousand, so Joshua just sent a few thousand to go and to take the land. Well, what happened is that little town of Ai 
beat the snot out of them. And they came back with their tail between their legs as they're coming back. And Joshua is so distraught, he falls on his face before the Lord. And the Lord says, Joshua, get up off your face and go take care of it. You got sin in the camp. Deal with it. Hmm. And so sometimes the Lord wants us to do that. He didn't want him to, to pray. He wanted him to change. And that's what happens in our life. Or sometimes that we just need to change. Write this down. Change will heal and allow you to be all that you can be. And that's why struggle is not bad. We look at struggle as something bad and we start looking at things. Well, she said this and he said this and they did this and they did this. When there's something much greater than that that the Lord wants to deal with. And he will heal and allow you to be all that you can be. And sometimes we have to be in pain so much before we change. And then the last one here. Struggles develop proven character. Struggles develop proven character. Best character classroom in the world is that of struggle. In Hebrew 5.8 it says this. Although he was a son... He learned obedience from the things which he, say with me, suffered. The Lord suffered so much for us. And as we go through struggles, it does something with our character because impurities seem to be burned out when we go through the fire. You know what I'm talking about? Because a lot of times we focus on things and our own securities and things that are important. And then we go through the fire and we find out what exactly is important. And our character begins to change and we become more mature. Hmm. You know what makes you valuable? Not that you suffer, but what you learn through suffering. Have you ever seen anybody go through a struggle and they go through a struggle and they go through a struggle and they never learn from their struggles? And they keep going down the same path, doing the same thing, because they never learned. You know, you call that insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Israel, when they got delivered, they were 11 miles away from the promised land, and it took them 40 years to get there. And it's not because the man didn't stop and ask for directions. <laughs> it was because of their own stubbornness and their own lack of faith. Never learning. Here God did miracle after miracle after miracle, and they never quite grasped a hold of who God was. Write this down. Learning from suffering causes you to be wise and valuable. Learning from suffering causes you to be wise and valuable. Again, Every single one of us in life, life is just made up this way. 10% of what happens to all of us will be that of struggle. But what we do with that 90% is so important because I've seen 10% that people go through, that 10%, that little slice of life has ruined many people because they focus on the problem. They focus on that 10% instead of the 90% of what they do with that. And usually our attitude needs to change and things change in our life. We need to focus more upon the Lord and less upon ourselves. In 2 Corinthians 4.16 it says this, Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. About four or five weeks ago I shared a story with this lady in that made such an impact in my life. Her name was Dorothy. She had Bible studies all over town. She spoke at different places, highly respected. And as she was going through her sickness that ultimately took her life in her Luke Gehrig's disease where she was losing abilities of her muscles and eventually she couldn't talk. But yet she would write messages to me on a whiteboard. So encouraging with a smile on her face as it was 
debilitating in her life, she yet maintained a joy that was indescribable. It made me think of this verse in Nehemiah 8.10, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. See, the only way we can have joy is if we go through it knowing that God loves us and he has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. For Dorothy, he was getting her ready for the greatest journey of her life. We all go through struggles. And I think Peter would say, when you go through struggles, keep on rejoicing because it comes from a loving father. Count it all joy when we go through various trials and struggles because it's working perseverance. It's working something in us that we will lack nothing. I have something that I go through when I go through struggles and reminded of struggles that I do just automatically. I start identifying with the struggles that Christ went through, the sufferings of Christ, how Christ was uh, abandoned by those who said that they would die for him. I'm sure at times he was lonely and hurt, times of loss, times of pain, betrayal from someone who said was his friend. They took Jesus, and can you imagine God Almighty in the form of Jesus who came to save the world, and yet the ones who he came to save was the very ones who tried to murder him and take his life. The Bible says they beat him beyond recognition of a man as they pulled his beard, as they put a crown of thorns on his head. And then he freely got up on that cross and he says, I love you this much. And he took the penalty of sin upon himself. And the good news is he rose again. The Bible says this, in the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he passed it out. And then he says, this is my cup of the new covenant, which is his blood, which we have the forgiveness of sin because his blood was shed, just like in the Old Testament where they put the blood over the doorpost and the, the, the death angel passed over that house. It was symbolic how we are covered by the blood of the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. He took it, he blessed it, he broke it, and he passed it out. How many of you the Lord has taken you? Yes. Raise your hand. The Lord takes us. He blesses us. He breaks us. Breaks us of self. Breaks us of selfishness. <laughs> And then he passes us out. He takes us, he blesses us, he breaks us, and he passes us out as we are called the body of Christ. Mm. And the struggles that we go through is a breaking of ourselves. <laughs> that when people see us, they no longer see us, but they see Christ in us. The Bible says as often as we do this, we do this in remembrance of what Christ accomplished on the cross for all of us. Would you stand with me and I'm gonna say a prayer for us and when I'm done praying, if you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again, I wanna invite you after we pray just to come up and receive the elements. You can take it back to your chair or receive it here. But let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you. Lord, we thank you for your love for each and every one of us that you care so much about us, that you came and you died for us. And not only that, but Lord, you're in every aspect of our lives. Lord, you say you know how many hairs we have on our head. You know when a sparrow falls from a tree and how much more do you know about each and every aspect of our lives. 
Lord, I pray for those who are going through struggles right now. May they sense your very presence, oh Lord. May they not ask why, but ask what is it, oh Lord, that you would have me change. For some, it's just repenting and confessing and getting back on track to where you need to be. For some, it's changing maybe a habit, maybe a relationship and coming back to your first love, which is Jesus. Lord, thank you that we celebrate today all that you accomplish upon the cross at Calvary. And so, Lord, we receive the bread and we receive the cup as receiving everything that you accomplish for us upon the cross at Calvary. And that you are a living God. Lord, thank you for the suffering and the struggle you went through that we might be saved. Help us in our struggle to identify with you, O oh Lord, because we are part of your body. Lord, thank you, and we love you. And in Jesus' name we pray, all God's people say, amen.